Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Contemporary Art Museum. It is a pleasure to see so many faces here for this morning's event. I'm Lisa Melandry, director here, and I'm going to pass this off to Dominic Malone, chief curator and organizer of this beautiful incarnation of Jeremy Deller, Joy and People. Um, I will just tell you to please make sure that you pick up a calendar on the way out, and this is not to jump over the riches of this morning's event, but to let you know that we have an extraordinary slate of programs um, throughout the run of the exhibition uh, with myriad points of view perspectives and access points to the work here. Um, and there are many of those, which is one of the great joys of the exhibition. So please do take a look and come back and join us on any number of occasions and also just to have a cup of tea, which is always, I think, a great motivating factor. Come and spend some time in Valerie's. So Dominic Malone, if you could take us through the morning. All right. Thanks, everyone. I really wish I were the organizer of uh, this exhibition. I was the coordinator here at CAM. I have to give a big tip of my hat to Ralph Rugoff at the Hayward Gallery, who uh, organized the exhibition uh, and sent it on tour, and it's an incredible show, Jeremy Deller, Joy and People. Um, I'm really so pleased to be able to introduce today's artist talk, featuring uh, artist Jeremy Deller, who's taken over the entire CAM space in such a dynamic and comprehensive fashion. Uh, the show will remain on view uh, until April 28th. Jeremy will be joined today by Jonathan Harvey, Isam Pasha, and Nato Thompson, the key participants in his 2009 project, It Is What It Is, Conversations About Iraq, a multi-part endeavor commissioned by the New Museum of Contemporary Art and Creative Time in New York that comprised museum exhibitions in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, and a traveling presentation that stopped at various points in between, including St. Louis. The work prompted conversations and dialogues between the general public and American and Iraqi people who had been directly affected by the war in Iraq. Rather than our typical artist talks, uh, we decided that uh, a conversation um, uh, you know, between artist and curator, we decided that it would be an interesting change in pace to focus on one particular uh, piece within an artist's uh, oeuvre. And so um, to provide a sort of case study of sorts into window into Jeremy's process and the way his projects take shape. Uh, it is what it is, offers a really ideal opportunity in that regard because it really does uh, incorporate the direct uh, dialogue between artist, art, and, uh, and audience. I'll briefly introduce today's panel and then turn it over to them and they can reminisce about uh, that amazing, what it was, a three and a half week journey across the United States. Jeremy Deller began making art in the late 1980s and often making fleeting and subversive interventions in everyday situations. Since then, he has redefined the possibilities for the relationship between art and life with processions, performances, films and videos, multimedia installations and other projects that have been presented internationally. In 2004, he was awarded the Turner Prize and will represent the United Kingdom at this year's Venice Biennale. Jonathan Harvey has been a platoon sergeant in the U.S. Army since 1997 and is currently serving the U.S. Army Reserve. A specialist in the psychological effects of warfare, Harvey has lived in more than 25 countries, assisting in projects that include progressive teaching and leadership and man management roles in academic and military environments. He has received many honors during his career, military career, including the Bronze Star Medal, seven Army Achievement Medals, and an Army Commendation Medal. He is also an experienced teacher, including work at Veterans Upward Bound, where he taught low-income military veterans basic skills to prepare, prepare them for college classes. Oops. Born in Iraq, Isam Pasha is a translator, artist, and journalist who has worked as an interpreter for the British Embassy in Baghdad and the coalition in Iraq, including military groups such as the 101st Airborne and the Florida National Guard. Pasha has also been interpreter at in publications such as the Boston Globe and the Christian Science Monitor. He was a freelance journalist for the United Nations Integrated Regional Information Network and has written articles for, on art for international journals such as the art newspaper. Pasha, who is a well-known artist in Iraq, has also exhibited in the United States and Europe. 
In 2003, he executed the first post-war mural in Iraq, which is located in Baghdad. Nato Thompson is chief curator at Creative Time New York, as well as a writer and activist. His, among his projects for Creative Time are the exhibition and publication Living as Form, Socially Engaged Art from 1991 to 2011, as well as Tanya Bruguera's Immigrant Movement International, Democracy in America, The National Campaign, and Waiting for Godot, a project by Paul Chan held in New Orleans. He is also the author of the book Seeing Power, Art and Activism in the Age of Cultural Production. I'll now turn it over to our panelists. Thanks for coming, guys. You want me to start? Hey. Actually, oh, no, can go I ahead. Just, can I just say, one of my artworks is interfering because it's still on. I mean, maybe turn it off. It's yeah. just trying to get a bit of attention. But uh, Nato, if you want to start. Which, is that the one about the wrestler? No, it's the <laughs> minor strike is going on to my left. Oh, yeah. So I just want to. <laughs> Um, anyways, um, <clears throat> thanks for coming out. We really didn't know if anybody would come out in the morning, but um, we uh, were... Us we, included. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing some social practice late into the evening. <laughs> you guys have a very lively social practice community at 3 a.m. here in St. Louis. Thank you. Um, but we thought we would... We don't want to turn this into a kind of a reminiscing kind of journey, but we did go through a lot in a, in a kind of RV... Chevy Chase style American vacation with some serious subject matter. <clears throat> but we thought maybe we would go over some of the videos that actually happened here to give you a picture of what actually was the project uh, in terms of how it kind of played out. And from there we could kind of think about this both as an artwork but also in some ways it's kind of fascinating to think about this as an opportunity to consider the Iraq war which just it's just peculiar enough that we, I imagine all of us, would have never thought that we'd actually not be, as a country, the United States, in Iraq at this particular juncture. If anything, it was a, we imagine 10, 20 years down the road, but this is, it's an extraordinary kind of time to consider, to reflect on a war that this country was in. So it, that's kind of what we want to talk about. And also we kind of talk about how our lives have gone and, um, and also maybe, you know, we want to get to you guys too to think about this, both as an artwork, but also just as, as an opportunity to consider the political subject matter. So I suppose we should, um, I should describe what the project was. I'm sure some of you will know, but basically uh, it, it was a car that had been destroyed in Baghdad in a bomb attack. It wasn't, the car wasn't the weapon, but it was destroyed in a very big bomb attack on a, on a market. And the car, we got the car to the US and we basically showed it in some museums, but the meat of the project really was taking it on the road and touring it from New York to LA, taking it on a road trip and just turning up at towns and meeting people and showing them the car and just discussing it and um, that's the simplicity of the project it's, a, it's kind of a simple idea but we were never really sure quite how it would be received so every day that we did stop and do this we made little films and we're going to try and show a few from st louis i hope the sound works but we'll find out very quickly so we it was a record show. what was the record shop we stayed we were outside it's a, a big record shop here vintage vinyl and there's a guy, some tattooists were nearby, and they just started having a chat with Esam. Oh, and the guy at Vintage Vinyl said that the marquee was his free speech zone. And he always put different stuff up there, which was totally great. Yeah. So, I'm gonna do this. Oh, oh my goodness. That's good. That's we're going to put a mic next to the speaker and just see if it works. <laughs> Let's turn the volume up nice and loud. OK. Should we just see if, oh, let's see. Can you hear that? It's a bit shaky for some reason. I don't know, I mean, I, in Iraq we don't have a lot of people that have piercings. We have, have usually soldiers also have tattoos, but we don't have tattoo experts in Iraq. We have uh, people that, uh, you know, do tattoos for their friends in the army. And, Usually it's not professional looking and yeah, yeah. <laughs> perfect like, like these ones. But we don't do piercing in Iraq uh, really for right. romance. So I always wonder, how does that feel like? <laughs> does it hurt? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not great. I, yeah. I, I don't personally like it. I like having it, but I don't like the process. Eric yeah. <laughs> doesn't like the process. <laughs> but I mean, I, after a while, it's just, it's all relative. The, with the piercings, it's over so fast. Uh, all right. There's a difference like, this took about 
three seconds to actually get through, and I've got tattoos that I sat for three hours on. So, oh, it's a big difference. It's just, so this is easier, relatively. Yeah. I mean, it's a little more uncomfortable while it's healing up. It's a little more to get used to. But as far as comparing the piercing procedure to the tattoo procedure, it's just so much easier. Yeah, now it's heal easier than the. Big, big uh, area of the tattoo. But then afterwards, does it bother you? I mean, does it get caught on clothes? I mean, I have long hair. I always catch on clothes. Or yeah, you just get used to working around it. <laughs> well, then it, for you, it's worth the trouble because uh, a lot of people also ask me, long hair, doesn't that, does it worth the trouble? I go like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> catch on everything around me, but yet I, I'm happy with it. <laughs> could you hear any of that? Because we couldn't really hear that. You could hear that. So um, anyway, that really wasn't much about the war in Iraq, as you could tell, but, but then a lot of the conversations weren't. Um, I might just play the other one, which was a lot more about it, which was um, Harvey chatting to, um, what's the guy's name? Michael, Michael Berg. Michael Berg. Hopefully the sound will be St. Slight. Louis resident anarchist. Yeah. And they're sort of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other and trying to get the better of each other, basically. I'm wearing a Spider-Man shirt. Yeah, that's a, definitely a spider. I've, I've always, you know, growing up I read Spider-Man mm -hmm. and one of the things that he learned from Uncle Ben is with great power comes great responsibility. I would like to say that my country practices that. Well, I would like real, to say that real, too. But real politics get yeah. in the way. So I don't even worry about it. Mm -hmm. I don't even worry about it. What I worry about is I've got my guys, this is the orders we've got, we've, we've received. I think, am I a conscious objector? No, I'm not. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, you know, do my job. At what point would the actions the government have to take before you would say, I cannot follow these orders? If I cannot participate in, in this, in this uh, activities? Every soldier has an obligation if they receive an illegal order uh, mm -hmm. to refuse it. Correct, but if the war itself is illegal, then that doesn't enter the picture? The war was had a UN mandate. No, it didn't. The war did not have a UN mandate. The UN did not. Vote by the time I was there, but by the time I received my order to go, the UN. When, when did you go? 2008. Oh, 2008. Oh, sure. But the the initial invasion was done illegally by international. I didn't participate in the in the invasion. Right, but the only reason America is there is because of the illegal invasion. I mean, it's it, it's the same process. It, part of the problem with law is that something is illegal if mm -hmm. if it's against the law. Something that is against the law, you change the law, all of a sudden it's not illegal anymore. Well, the problem with international law is it's unenforceable. And the problem with, uh, with the, the description of the invasion as having been illegal is that retroactively, the UN said, okay, you're there, great. Well, the, the You've got U a mandate now. The UN is heavily influenced by what the United States wants. And then once it's... The, the, the world powers sure, but, have, but, have but, an but, interest in but that's keeping real, the oil flowing and keeping some degree of stability and keeping... Um, right, but, but that's real politics. Things happen. Yeah. I mean, and so if you rely on an argument of what's, what's illegal in terms of international law, when the, one of the main bodies of international law, like the United Nations, uh, goes ahead and retroactively says, okay, it's not illegal anymore, then you're kind of hoisted on your own petard. You can't say it is illegal and not illegal at the same time. What do you think the role of the United States should be in the world? Or do you not concern yourself? I would like, again, the Spider-Man philosophy. Uh -huh. <laughs> that conversation went on for some time, actually. That was just a little bit. Wasn't it? <laughs> but that was really, I think, that was quite a, joust, a jousting match, I would say. Yeah. Maybe we can turn it over to our... I think when we went on the road, we came up with the term talk stars. Um, but it's kind of funny, too, because in a way, you guys were, I mean, me too, to some degree, but predominantly you two were, the, were part of an artwork, which is kind of weird, but you seem to roll with it just fine. Maybe you could just talk about being in the project and how that went for both of you. Uh, well, I'll start. Uh, for me, it was, it was a very cathartic experience, uh, and it was more cathartic than I even understood at the time. Uh, the, I had just gotten back. 
uh, from Iraq just a couple of months before the project. And it was a very emotionally trying uh, deployment. And having that opportunity to go and, and talk with people, um, I was able to unload a lot of baggage. Uh, so for me, it was, it was very, very personally enriching. Uh, and that was an experience that I, I got to see uh, Every, almost every stop, we attracted at least a couple of uh, veterans, many of whom had been to Iraq or Afghanistan. And I got to sort of see the same thing in, in them, uh, that you know, they were able to talk about things that they hadn't been able to talk about with you know, the, their families, their friends back home. Uh, and so just for, for me, that was, that was uh, the biggest, biggest benefit. Well. I've been in the U.S. for like three years when this project uh, started. <clears throat> the main purpose of the project is to get people familiar with uh, what's happening in Iraq and get to talk to an Iraqi. And in museums, there were several uh, Iraqis or people that spent time in Iraq talking to uh, uh, the public. For me, it was, uh, this is a two-way street. I wanted to know what the public thought about uh, the war in Iraq, how did they perceive it, and what kind of questions they had. And um, uh, because when I was here, the only people that I met is I got introduced to them. So in some way, they uh, thought that I, I think they had an obligation to be kind of polite and considerate and whatever. So to just get on an uh, interactive with people on the street and uh, just freely talk to them and see what they're going to do. And I had no idea how this is going to turn up. I thought that they're going to be sometimes a little violence uh, involved, but uh, it all went uh, very much fine. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. It's one of the reasons to pick a big Iraqi who knows <laughs> judo. <laughs> <laughs> who wears leather gloves often across America. Yeah, I think we were, it was sort of a journey into the unknown, but that's, that was the exciting part of it. We really had no idea what to expect from, from minute to minute. And that's what's, for me, that's the excitement of taking an artwork out of a gallery, is that you're at the mercy of the elements, but also at the mercy of the public. So you never really know who's going to walk around the corner next and what their life experience is and what they feel about those things. So that was very, that was exciting because we sort of lost control of the project in that way. And uh, it stopped being an art project as well. I don't think that was really spoken of so much. It just became a thing, not a phenomenon really, that would be an exaggeration, but it just became this thing that was happening that ne didn't necessarily have to be art or, or whatever. And it wasn't really activism either. But um, that was the most exciting thing. And uh, by the end of the project, we would, we have, we, you'd go up to anyone in the street and give them the flyer, and you, you'd feel confident about it, and we're, which was kind of amazing, really, to, to just go up to total strangers and start talking to them. I didn't think I'd ever do that, because we were sort of terrified to begin with. I was very, very nervous about being physically attacked. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but it didn't happen at all, which kind of was a very encouraging thing about the US for me as well. By the end, Jeremy was willing to even run after joggers, trying to chase them down to give them the flyers. That's true. I've got a photograph of it. I might even show you. So we, we were, were quite proactive in that way, but um, quite bland as well, the way we presented the work. We, weren't, we didn't go in with like flashing lights and bells and whistles, as we'd say. We were very, it was, if anything, it was a very calm uh, presentation of, of, of it. It's funny, too, because um, it really inspired me about what, I mean, I really get bored by questions about what is or isn't art, but the form of this really revealed itself over time. And what I mean is, it was a project about conversations, but when you think about conversations, they're not exactly something you look at. They're not visually exciting. I mean, literally, we'd be on a street, and it'd be one person talking to Esau, or maybe one person talking to two of them, and that would be the project. So as you can imagine, that's not exactly a visually exciting thing to do. and you'd, it, at the same time, we began to realize that's the, that's the feel of this project. And as you kind of, kind of just took your, you know, you did, I, we didn't know what, when we went out first, I just imagined lots of people wanting to talk about Iraq. But it really was like one or two people at a time, which is like how conversation works. But what was amazing is when you started listening to the conversations, people had such profound things to say or personal stakes in the war, how many, how many people's lives were touched by war. You know, often people think the United States is some place that's totally not, you know, personally connected with the places they go to war to. 
But we, often the project triggered a lot of reactions from people that had some personal stakes there. You know, I wonder what you guys thought about that, in terms of how the, your expectations were changed or, you know, who you came in contact. Because I know for you, Harvey, a lot of veterans kind of sought you out. Mm -hmm. And then Esam, the Iraqi, everyone kind of, the 300 pound Iraqi. <laughs> There's a 300 pound Iraqi in the room. <laughs> well, we're not discussing <laughs> Apart from the weight, <laughs> uh, actually a lot of families wanted to talk to me and show me uh, some of the, their scrapbooks and uh, some uh, little drawings that they made and their thoughts or dreams about the war. Some of them thought it's uh, much more uh, horrific than what it really was. Uh, some of them know thoughts light of it and uh, totally uh, uh, justifying it in their minds. And I was happy sometimes to pick that up and uh, tell them that war, all do not go always as planned and uh, stuff like that. But I think what was interesting that often people, uh, Christians, so we, we met a Christian, someone who called himself a Christian extremist in um, Dallas, and people who are of that ilk would often want to talk to Isam, especially because they'd never met someone like him before, and so they were really intrigued by him. And they were trying to sort of argue points with him and so on. So he attracted a lot of people with extreme religious views. <laughs> A fundamentalist, I'd say. In, in terms of expectations, um, getting back to that question, uh, you know, especially as we were talking on the phone, coordinating for the trip, you know, one of the things that Jeremy had expressed some concern with is that we might get, you know, sort of right wingers attacking us, or you know, that was really the the main, at least what he was communicating to me, the the main uh, concern as far as you know potentially triggering violence. Uh, but it turned out that you know, as far as any negative reactions. We tended to get it more from people on the left rather than the, on the right. That, you know, this project, how dare it not take an anti-war stance? You know, how dare it just be conversations about the war without taking a, you know, a, a moral stance on whether it's good or bad? Uh, and and that, that to me was, was not what I was expecting. Yeah, the activists were the hardest uh, on us uh, because, as he said that, uh, you need to take a stand, not to be open to suggestions and questions and uh, opinions. Of course, that was not what the show is all about. It's funny, too, because um, actually our, our debut was a nightmare. We went to D.C. It was cold and And it wet. was raining. And the only person that showed up was like a, a specialist on Iraq who told us how horrible the project was for four <laughs> hours. <laughs> And he knew his stuff as well, so we were sort of listening and sort of, uh, sort of not exactly agreeing with him, but we were just taking the, the beating, basically, from him. And uh, we, we hadn't really worked out how we, how we would engage the public. And we would have loved to have said, hey, listen, it's time for me to go talk to someone else, but there wasn't anybody else showing up. Because the thing, it, it started, I think, in, it was in March or yeah. around then, and it was, it was a cold, wet day. We were on the National Mall, and people just don't, I mean, you got all these nice, warm, free museums. You're going to go in there. You're not going to hang out in the cold and wet. Unless you're a kind of a, he was a sort of political consultant. He knew his stuff and it was just, wouldn't leave us alone, basically. But his point, which really kind of haunted us the whole time, and in fact, to go to what the left activists, many of my friends hated about this project, was he said, this is like you go to New Orleans and there's, so the streets are flooded and there's bodies going by you and you want to talk about the merits of Cajun food. He said, this is no time to just be kind of sitting on the fence or reflecting open-endedly about something called a war. We're in a war. People are dying. This is a time to take a stand. And that, that was, you know, how did you feel about that, Isam? I mean, well, uh, it's not some small thing to throw at us. What, what, what he said was uh, right, but it was not a fair comparison because uh, he compared being in the flood. And I told him, uh, we are not in a war zone right now. If we were in a war zone, we, have, we would be doing something totally different. But uh, the thing is, there are people here that do not think about war. It's just like something we had to do, the experts is doing their work, the soldiers are sent there, end of story, I don't want to think about it. We bring um, uh, interest to them. We uh, kind of uh, raise some questions and uh, talk about the subject, hey, let's talk about it and uh, to not being so urgent about it like an activist and um, go knock on doors and give people pamphlets and you have to stand this way and tell people what to do. Uh, there are people doing this, but this is not what 
art is about, this is not what uh, the exhibition is about. This is an exhibition and it takes place in a peaceful community, not in a war zone. So his comparison was not really true, was not really fair. But we still couldn't work out. Yeah, I mean, you did answer him, but we were, we were quite shocked to be sort of so comprehensively battered by him for like hours and like on end. But um, that was a good, it's probably good to start with that. And we realized at that point that we needed to give out flyers to the public so they could actually read what we were doing before we had to explain it. So, because you can't explain to hundreds of people. So we learned a little bit about marketing, really. I think that, and that's a terrible word, but that's what it was. But that's kind of interesting, because I know Harvey, his job in Iraq was also about that sort of communication gap or trying to win people over to an idea or at least engage them. So I don't know whether you saw any comparison to what you're doing in Iraq to what you're doing in the US when we went on a tour and tried to talk to people. Well, I'm not allowed to see much of a comparison because what I do overseas is uh, you know, basically, I'm a psychological operations specialist, and that's something you're not allowed to do in the United States. Uh, it's okay. roughly analogous to marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so I was not conducting PSYOP in the United States. Um, but ultimately, you know, he, he's right. You know, one of the things that, that we do, because, you know, in terms of the United States uh, communicating uh, with, you know, people like Esam, you know, he speaks English, but there are a lot of Iraqis who don't. There are a lot of Afghans who don't. Uh, so how do we communicate with them? Uh, and that's where, you know, you got to figure out what are the best ways of, of accessing your, your audience. Uh, and for us, you know, initially we thought, well, we're going to be driving around with this big, you know, bombed out car. You know, so that's going to be what's going to attract people over. But, you know, one of the things, you know, you've got your, your dynamics. If you don't have anything to hand someone, then when you go up, uh, you, it's, it's a very in-your-face thing. You know, you're just st standing there looking at this bombed-out car, and now all of a sudden me or Isam comes over to you and tries to strike up a conversation. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It puts them off, off a little bit. But if we can hand them something, and then they can peruse it, uh, they can engage with us if they want to at that time, or they can, you know, just stand back and, and read it and decide whether to participate or not. The other big thing was, you know, NATO, Jeremy, or, or some of the other folks that were with us were able to hand these out while uh, Isam or I were involved in a conversation. And that way, if the person wanted to get involved in the conversation, they would, whereas they might not have just gone up to interrupt a conversation because they don't necessarily know what's going on. So it was a very, very good, good learning point for us. Yeah, and always the first uh, conversation is the uh, toughest because it breaks the ice when uh, somebody passing by sees two people talking they would be uh, compelled to at least listen or take part but the first one that you want to uh, spark and uh, or engage in a conversation with is a bit hard so once we broke the ice the day would go fine it's funny you know the show is called joy and people um, and that seems such a silly title in a way it is <laughs> it wasn't my first choice. What was your first choice? Well, I've told you my first choice and you hated it, but I'm going to tell everyone here it was going to be animal, vegetable, pop music. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just thought was brilliant, but no one asked it. And um, so we, we reverted to this, my secondary choice, which I felt was too positive, to be honest. Um, uh, I heart melancholy yeah, compared to... Yeah. Uh, but it helped. I think people liked going to see the show in London at least because it had a, at least has a positive title. But you know, this is not necessarily positive artwork or piece. You know, but but um, I think it it worked. But I'm just curious about that sentiment in this project because, in some ways, joy and people kind of became something that we've. <laughs> I know when we talked about this initially, we really did think like right wingers were going to be attacking it. It was also just to be fair. The mo I think when you began talking about the project was a year before we went on the road, and the mood in the country, as we all know, shifted against the war pretty rapidly. But at the same time, we found America to be a rather sweet place. Mm. I mean, maybe we could just talk about our perspectives on people as a subject matter. Well, I've always found Americans incredibly polite and incredibly gracious, and much more so than British people, and, uh, or, or French, or you know, Europeans on the whole. Americans are incredibly uh, open and warm people on the whole. But if you watch TV, you'd never get that impression. 
<laughs> you'd never get, you know. So actually, you, you're given a very bad press by your media and by sort of TV and so on, because actually Americans are much more different from the way they're, por they're portraying themselves effectively. And I found, we found that out. So even people that had nothing in common with us and didn't agree with us one bit, or some of us one bit, were incredibly interested and gracious. So that was very encouraging. Um, so that, that was one of the revelations, to be honest, um, that you could actually have a, a, a rational discussion with someone who you, you, you totally disagreed with on most things, who thought the world was created 4,000 years ago, but you could still talk <laughs> about something. Yeah, because it was really painted in these stark red state, blue state kind of ways, and that like someone that was pro-war would never be able to sit down to a conversation with someone that was anti-war, as though there were two personalities. And to be fair, I fell into that. I fall into that still, constantly, uh, into those kind of dichotomies around kind of political public life. But it wasn't, you know, maybe you guys could just talk about your kind of feelings about people, your joy in people, well, <laughs> or lack thereof. It was really joy in people because, as Jeremy said, in Europe, everybody think of themselves that they have to have a stand on every matter. So when you discuss something with them, they already have preconceived ideas, and they just start to defend their ideas before they hear about it from you. Uh, with the Americans, uh, they don't have this kind of thinking. I, I, I found out that uh, they are open to whatever you're going to say. They think about an idea, but still they need to learn more about it. And that's a very positive way in uh, conversation. And a lot of people, I feel, that learned a lot about the war just because they could listen. They would say, okay, we need to learn something. I don't know everything about this matter. So uh, this flexibility really was refreshing and it was really joy in people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was very surprised. Uh, I think it started out growing up as a white kid in a black neighborhood in Philadelphia. Um, I'm used to being around different people. Um, you know, in, being in the military, I spend some time on active duty. I spend some time, you know, just on reserve status. Uh, I've, you know, I taught English uh, in Tunisia for a year. Uh, spent a year in in Ireland. You know, I've I've been a lot of different places, interacting with people very different from me for a lot of my adult life. Um, and so, so ultimately, people are people. Um, and nobody wakes up in the morning, well, OK, maybe some people do, but very few people wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to be a complete jackass today. <laughs> some you know, days I did that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's why I made my exception. Um, you know, people are, you know, and even, even in all the bad stuff that happens in the world, you know, that's more because all of us collectively are dumber than any one of us, uh, and and meaner too. Uh, but when you when you're dealing with somebody one on one, you know, unless they've got some sort of vested interest in in being a jerk, um, you people are people. Which is a Depeche Mode song, by the way. There's a, there's a film up there about Depeche Mode, so it's a nice link. Yeah. Um. But, you know, just also to kind of shift to a kind of art thing, it was interesting because, um, I mean, this has been the case for a long time, but people always debate whether things are art or not. And I, there was a really annoying New York Times review of your show that basically said something like, to, uh, to get the gist of it, I think it said something like, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's art, but it's a good cathartic way to have a dialogue about the war or something like that, right? Mm. But um, <clears throat> that says a lot to me about the limits of what people want out of art. The fact that like, there's cathartic discussions about the war separate from art. And maybe you could just talk about that because often people, I mean, you get put in these categories, you often deal with the kind of texture of public life in some way. Yeah, that doesn't, those kind of criticisms don't bother me. It just shows a sort of poverty of imagination, I think, on, on the behalf of the person writing it. So uh, that's not a problem. And even if it's not art, it doesn't matter because it's something else. It's something, and it's alive, and it exists. So to criticize it on those terms, it's almost too late because it's out there and, 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 it's, and it's living, especially a project like this. It, it, was, it was live almost. So that's, that's, that doesn't bother me so much. Um, and sometimes it's a compliment almost to say it's not art. Not that I don't like art. It's just it's, um, 
it's just beyond the it's beyond the sort of comprehension of someone as art. I mean, that's that's good. That's pushing it. Maybe maybe that's my way of rationalising it. So I'm. I, I didn't read that review. I tend not to read any reviews, either good or bad, because if you read the good ones, you've got to read the bad ones. And in a way, good reviews are, are almost as stressful as bad reviews. And so I've learned very quickly not to just get involved in that obsession with reviews and so on. So, but I did hear about it. I mean, the museum was mortified, because there's a New York Times, you know, bad New York Times review is, is, is as bad as it gets, basically. I think that's how, what they felt, yeah. but I, I just, it's not my city, so it doesn't really bother me. <laughs> so uh, it's their problem, effectively. I'm, I'm the one up here who has probably the least involvement in the art world. And to me, Apart from it was, it, other than being the exhibit, uh, it, was, it was sponsored by art museums and art organizations. Um, it was conceived by an artist. You know, at some point, if it you know, quack, quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, what are you going to call it? <laughs> well, there was a lot of confusion. A lot of uh, uh, one phrase we used to say a lot on the trip to people: uh, "The car is not the artwork." Uh, there was a little confusion that people thought the car presented in the museum is the artwork, and uh, a lot of people told me that this is a the remains of um, a war. It cannot be a, a work of art, and I keep telling them. The car is not the artwork. The whole activity, the whole exhibition, is, a, is the uh, art piece. It's not the car. So that's a little bit. Uh... Yeah, I mean, the car was really a relic, almost. In, you know, in medieval times, that an object like that would have been paraded through towns and cities and countries, almost like a religious relic. That's how I felt. What we had there was um, a piece of evidence as well. It's like a piece of evidence. One of the things you see on a lot of uh, military bases, uh, somewhere near the front gate, they'll have a a car that was involved in a um, uh, drunk driving accident, just sort of, sort of as a reminder, you know, you don't want to end up like that. Yeah. Well, weirdly, there's a photograph in this exhibition of a similar car from a town in the desert that three teenagers were killed in a, with a big crucifix attached to it. So, yeah, it's, it's a tradition. I wasn't doing anything new, really, in, in that respect. And the cars now, talk about what happened to the car. Well, the car now, it still exists. I mean, it's in not a, obviously, it's in not great condition because it's uh, because of what happened to it but it's in the permanent collection of the Imperial War Museum in London and until recently the museum is now being redeveloped so it's not on display because the museum's closed it was actually the first thing you saw as you walked into the museum there's a big atrium huge atrium with literally with Sherman tanks a V2 rocket a Spitfire you know one of these very dramatic atriums that has all these planes and rockets and bombs and so on and it was more or less the first thing you'd see when you walk in but it's so. just such a, you know, I just, it's so amazing to me because in some ways in my mind that's such a huge testament to the success of the project. And I mean that because it entered into a different cultural space of representation. It was the representation of war. And like Jeremy says, you know, as opposed to the bombers and the missiles and the tanks, all in their kind of, you know, gussied up glory, it was this tragic remains and it was it was like a critical piece in this war museum yeah which is why they wanted it because they were trying to you know they're trying to rethink representing war especially when you have a name like the imperial war museum <laughs> <laughs> that's a very loaded very loaded term and they are actually very even though it's a difficult name for a museum they're very proud of it because it actually that's what it is so it's it's it was something to be proud of maybe 60 years ago but now it's actually something to be very heavily investigated and questioned now, and they, they like that in the museum. But um, yes, I mean, it's obviously, and it also as an object, it shows that the nature of war has changed, and that the civilians are the main casualties and the main target, not soldiers often. They're the people that suffer much more, and that's a, that's a relatively recent thing. I think we should take questions. Do you want to do, are you going to do it? Sure. I've got plain to catch, so I've got to run off in about 40 <laughs> minutes, so that's why I'm just... <laughs>
I'll repeat it. If you couldn't hear that question, what actually happened when we turned up? How was it planned? Look, sometimes there'd be a, a, like a welcoming committee because people knew we were going to be there. Other times there was next to nothing or nobody there and we would just set up where we were and we just had a permit and there was maybe one person to come and greet us basically. And then, so we were just there and we just wait for people to walk by. And there was the car blown up that was on the back of, on a flatbed so people could see it and there was a sign small sign that described what had happened to the car. So it's a, I forget the text. This car was destroyed in a bomb attack in a marketplace in Baghdad. March it's it's in the photo on the program. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that was on all the time. So when we were on the road, people would see that. And you'd watch, you'd see hundreds and, or thousands over a period of time, people watch, looking at it and very dangerously taking photographs no, of it from the car. And also honking at us and giving us a thumbs up, which we didn't know. Yeah. What does it mean? We didn't know what that meant. You're driving well, a finger up. out car and you're giving a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it was very low key. I read your sign. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a way, it's like a bumper sticker. You know, the way the bumper stickers work in America. I've always been fascinated by the sort of bumper sticker wars in, in America. We don't have them in Britain, where people say they're pro this or anti that or they hate this or these people. And, you know, immigration, gun control, abortion, all those things, those, those, uh, those battles are fought on the backs of people's cars. And we don't have that in Britain. We don't have that sort of politicization of cars. So uh, it's effectively what it is. It's a kind of walking advertisement for an idea. So in a way, towing that car across with its own sort of bumper sticker was a version, like a, like a, a very bizarre, morbid version of, 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 of bumper sticker battles that you see in the US. The question was, how was I able to connect with such an affable, aff affable group of guys? Well, it was a kind of random, kind of a random process. We did interviews with groups of peop uh, with people. We had a two days of interviews with Iraqis who were living in the U.S., former translators. And um, what we realized very soon was that most people had a story, and they would tell you their story because of a trauma. I think that's what you're told to do if you go undergo trauma. You tell a story, and you keep telling it, and you keep telling it as a way of working through it or working it out. And so a lot of people told us their stories, which are often incredibly uh, sort of sad and tragic stories. So we had that for a day. And then at the end of one day, Isam walks in wearing an ankle-length leather coat <laughs> with sunglasses and a beret and sort of leather, leather gloves. And he started talking to us in a different way. He's talked to us about culture and his work and how he'd what he'd done, but also he talked not just about his very, very personal experiences, but about a wider world, which was Iraq, which is something we were also interested in people finding out about, about religion and cuisine and language and so on. So he was very, very different from everyone else. And so we thought, right, this is our person, basically. And Harvey, we interviewed on, uh, for, he was in Alaska, and we interviewed him on, on the phone. And he just talked a lot, and we thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up with the title It Is What It Is and, and which I thought because uh, I hadn't had a title for the project at that point I thought that's interesting I've never heard that before which of course it's, everyone knows about it in America so that's why we chose it so if, if, you know he came up with the title and I just thought well we've got to give it to this guy <laughs> and he talks to it <laughs> Jessica <laughs> with the mic To what extent um, you thought about including a woman in your dialogue and whether or not the public was um, also curious about maybe a feminine perspective on the project. When you said affable guys, it, it all the more highlighted that yeah. to me. No, that's true. We were aware of this and we did interview female Iraqis and we nearly chose one. But again, it was really because of um, the way that she was talking about the war and it was very specific, and we didn't know whether that, we could continue with that sort of story all the time. And we, we were looking for someone with a, a broader perspective, a more historical perspective. But it was considered. I, mean, I know it doesn't, it looks like, you know, it looks like we're a band who are reuniting and just about to announce it. <laughs> Some terrible boy band. But we were, it was, we did, we did consider that. But by chance, it really was by chance. But we didn't interview any female soldiers. No, no female soldiers came forward. 
It would have been an, a much different dynamic on the RV. <laughs> For better or worse, I mean, really. It would have been very different. But, but it, that wasn't why we chose all men. men. But I, I know exactly understand what you're saying. first question, that idea of, I mean, you're drawing on very specific sympathies by putting a bombed car versus, if, yeah, if you had a tank on that thing, you, you might be drawing different conversations, right? RV wouldn't have been able to tell it. <laughs> well, but it, it draws upon a specific kind of conversation, right? So I'm wondering also, the conversation of taking it specifically that happened in Clayton would be very likely and very different than what's happening in the Central West End or down the city. So I'm wondering if you could share with us Well, um, just a few thoughts about sites. They varied across the country for different reasons, practical, as you might imagine, the institutions have. But also we were, re we were really, I mean, a lot of the trip was spent more in the South, which we considered kind of more red statey, if you will. Um, but, you know, it's funny because the bomb, you know, it's funny because people say, hey, this is just, we'd say, hey, this project has no politics, but clearly, you're right, like it is to some degree a political intention to show that versus like a tank, right? To show a victim of war. I mean, it's not like some heroic thing to tow this wreckage of car around. So there, it's not unobvious that there's some kind of sympathetic humanity going on in the project. Simultaneously, I must say that um, the biggest group of people that came to the project, I would say, were veterans or people who had family in, in Iraq at that time. And we saw a familiar pattern, which was they would kind of scope it out for a while to feel out if it, what the politics of it were, to see if it was an anti-war thing. But when it, it didn't fit in that kind of classic category of pro or anti-war, it was in this nebulous zone, that's when it really became an open space and really generative. So I would say that like, despite, I would say, I think like, it didn't, it didn't, it was really, it was really important to have it not read too anti-war or pro-war, you know, to be really to some degree nebulous, because to open up that space of safety to talk, particularly with people that had the most at stake in the conversation, that felt like, I had a deep sense of, I mean, you could speak to this, I had a deep sense of frustration that other people were speaking on behalf of their very intense stories. Also, I chose a car because originally this project started in London and there's a model there of a plinth, there's a plinth in Trafalgar Square, uh, which is the sort of main square of London and it's empty. It was meant to have had a king on it, uh, on a horse in the 18th century, but they didn't raise enough money to make the sculpture because by subscription and so there's an empty plinth and contemporary art has been going on this plinth for 10 years. And I suggested a car that had been destroyed in Iraq to go on the plinth as a, as a as basically something for the British general public to see uh, something from that conflict, which you know you don't get to see anything from it basically, you just see the news. And also a car in the UK, there are very, very strict rules in Britain about what you can and can't show on the news. Like in America, you can't show bodies, for example, charred bodies or dead people. Very, very rare did you see that. And so um, the car becomes the substitute or stand-in for a body. And I thought people probably would understand that when they see it sort of mangled burnt out shell of something, they realize it's virtually, st it's standing in for the, for the human. So that's why a car rather than a tank or, or um, was something I wanted. And I think it's fair to say too that, you know, the, the car bomb is, is kind of the, the, the signature weapon uh, that people think of, you know, the, the car bomb and the IED. Um, IED isn't quite as visually compelling and you have problems getting it in places. Even if it just looks like an IED, it's gonna, you know, raise security flags. But you know, the the blown up car, you know, even though it was not itself a car bomb, it evokes the sense of car bomb, uh, and so it, it's people automatically connect it to uh, to what's going on. Yeah, it has more contrast because it's a civilian car being bombed and involved in the war with a tank. It's a, it's a machine of war, so it's. A, Normal. It's, yeah, you almost expect it. Yeah. 
I hate to break up the band, but uh, thank you guys so much. Come for to the concerts next year. They're going to be yes. great. <laughs> Thank you.